She's dressed for the occasion because this is what they call a uh, slice of life cinema. Slice of life cinema. <laughs> This video celebrates the life of Judith, Adele, Knopf, Asmussen, Rosenberg. Daughter, sister, teacher, mother, wife, and friend. Respected for her musicianship, admired for her style, and adored for her kooky sense of humor, Judy Rosenberg is a woman that we will never forget. Judy's story begins on June 22, 1935, when Lucille Eleanor Elsie Rudy said, I do, to Irvin Carl Knopp in a small Lutheran ceremony in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. When we're out together dancing cheek to cheek. This was the height of the Depression, and both Lucille and Irvin earned a modest income as employees of the Marshall Ilsley Bank. Because times were hard, Lucille had to give up her job once they were married. But within three short years, Irv and Lucille felt they had saved enough money to take the plunge and start a family. Judith Adele Knapp was born on March 31, 1938. She weighed 8 pounds, 13 ounces, and her mother recorded in her baby book that she was smiling from the moment she was born. Lucille also reported that Judy was a beautiful baby whose blonde wavy hair and Shirley Temple dimples made her the darling of all their friends. And when it came to winning blue ribbon, Irv and Lucille bought their first home on 38th Street in Milwaukee during the same month as Judy's first birthday. Within no time, Irv had the place fixed up with a swing and a sandbox so that Judy could play hostess to all of the other children in the neighborhood. Already at a very young age, it was clear that Judy was a born performer and could often be seen standing on a pillar in front of her house, singing at the top of her lungs in her opera voice. In 1943, Judy became the proud big sister to her baby brother John. According to her mother, Judy could be trusted to take him for walks alone in the baby carriage when she was only five. Judy loved her little brother dearly and involved him in many activities, including all of her birthday parties. However, Judy did impose one requirement. John had to wear a little girl's dress so he could fit in with the rest of the invitees. If they don't, just send them both to me. Judy loved school from her first day of kindergarten. As a self-described perfectionist, she took pride in having the best book report, the most 100s in spelling, and the most interesting story in English. She also viewed herself as a Jill of all trades, but master of none, enjoying a wide variety of activities, ranging from dance, to book club, to art. And little the activity Judy loved best, however, was music. She loved music so much that she begged her parents to allow her to take piano lessons when she was nine, even though the family did not own a piano. Within a few months, Judy's parents saw how serious she was and spent their savings on a second-hand upright. By the age of 10, Judy was the star of the Victor Berger School Piano Recital. By age 11, was enrolled in the Wisconsin Conservatory of Music. By age 16, Judy earned her pocket money as a pianist at a local ballet school. And by age 19, had earned her piano teaching certificate and was teaching eight students. While at the Wisconsin Conservatory, Judy also met someone who would remain her friend for the rest of her life, Ralph Bodapek. I met Judy in 1954 when we were both 
taking music history and music theory classes at the Wisconsin Conservatory in Milwaukee on, on a Saturday. And uh, we had different piano teachers and we were from different neighborhoods, but we became very good friends. Uh, Judy was living in Fox Point uh, near the lake and I came from the other side of the tracks. But we hit it off with our common interests in uh, music. And she was always so dramatic and creative and fun-loving. Uh, she almost had me believing she had gone to a Swiss boarding school. We would walk together to the bus after classes. And uh, so you can imagine what a surprise, what a pleasant surprise it was to, when we met up together again 16 years later in East Lansing. And by that time, of course, we both had been married and had families. In 1951, the Knops were required to sell their home on 38th Street so that the city of Milwaukee could build a new expressway there. Lucille and Irvin viewed this as a stroke of luck, as it meant that they could move to the suburb of Whitefish Bay and their children could attend the excellent public schools there. Judy thrived at Whitefish Bay High School, where she continued to receive excellent grades and academic scholarships. In 1952, Judy was awarded a scholarship to Music Clinic in Madison, and in 1953, Judy was elected as Whitefish Bay's Badger Girl to study citizenship at the Wisconsin All-State Program. During this time, Judy also continued to study piano and participated in many extracurricular activities. She was particularly active in the school drama program and had the lead role in many plays. In 1954, Judy was awarded a full tuition scholarship to study occupational therapy at Milwaukee Downer College. Although she continued to achieve high grades in her courses, her primary interests were in her after-school activities that included theater and modeling. A semester did not go by where she didn't have the lead role in a play, and Judy was often featured in the Milwaukee State Journal as one of Downer's fashion trendsetters. During her junior year, Judy had the privilege of hosting Eleanor Roosevelt when she came to Downer to champion the United Nations. By this time, however, Judy had decided that she would not be happy in a career as an occupational therapist, so she transferred to the University of Wisconsin to pursue a degree in English in their excellent liberal arts program. While there, she continued to receive excellent grades and was on the Dean's List every semester until she graduated in 1959. Judy's fun-loving spirit and impeccable sense of style made her popular with both the girls and the boys. Throughout high school and college, she was seldom without a date and had a string of serious and not so serious boyfriends, as her brother John recalls. I remember her first boyfriend was Glenn Hankey, who had a car. He came by to my parents' house, drove up in the driveway. He was there to visit my sister. He was dating my sister, and I was annoyed at this. I didn't think it was right for him to take control of my parents' driveway. So as I went up the driveway with my bicycle, I, I made sure that I had a little scratch in his car. There were other people along the way. There was a Dick Brewer. There was a Dick Cott. There was uh, Bob Street. There was Frank Laycock. There was Jan Brinkman. So. 
These were a number of my sister's boyfriends. Some of these romances lasted a few weeks, while others lasted a few years. But at the end of her senior year, Judy met someone who put an end to all of her dating by asking her to marry him. That person was Jess Asmussen. Judy and Jess were engaged for only nine short months before they married on June 18, 1960. Jess had just received his Bachelor of Science degree in Electrical Engineering from the University of Wisconsin and was working at the Lewis Alice Corporation in Milwaukee, where Judy taught high school English. Within a year of their marriage, Judy gave birth to me, her first child, Kirsten Adele Asmussen. According to my mother, I was an easy baby, and she did not mind giving up her teaching job to take care of me. The three of us lived in Milwaukee for another year until my father moved us back to Madison so he could pursue his Ph.D. We lived in Eagle Heights married student housing from 1962 to 1967. I don't remember much from that time in our lives, but my mother clearly did, as we can hear in an interview she did with her piano student, Rini Sarker, this past year. What, where did you live? Where was your community? What was your home like? Who did you live with? Okay, by that time I was married, oh. and my husband was working on a graduate degree at the University of Wisconsin and so we lived in married student housing and it was very sparse. Uh, one big room was the living room and the kitchen and the kitchen was just one wall of very small appliances and then there were two bedrooms, tiny bedrooms and the color was uh, very ugly gray and so I begged the housing authorities to paint it kind of a pretty gold. Yes. As long as if when we moved we painted back to ugly gray. That's so interesting. Did you have any children? Yes, I did. I had uh, I had a child who was at that time when we moved in a year, a year and maybe three months. And then while we were living there, I had, that was a girl. And then while we were living there, I had a boy. My brother Jess was born in 1964. During the day, my mother stayed home and cared for us. And then in the evening, she taught piano to over 20 pupils in the comfort of their own homes. And then when we moved to student housing, in 61 or 2, um, I put up a sign in the local market and said that I would be willing to teach at a student's home. And I got so many responses, more than I could handle. So my husband planned all these classes in the morning so that he could come home by four o'clock and that I could go out and teach. My father received his PhD on June 5, 1967. That following August, the four of us crowded into our tiny Volkswagen Beetle and drove to East Lansing, Michigan to start our new life there. <laughs> 